the Grey Man, the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, the Moon Maniac, and the Bogeyman, all nicknames used to describe the American serial killer, Albert Fish. In today's case, presented by Molly Westbrook, we're going to explore the gruesome and twisted tale of Albert Fish and what exactly happened in the state of New York between 1924 and 1932. This is the Crime Time Podcast featuring your hosts Joshua Miles, Dark Curiosities, Molly Westbrook and Kirsty Skye. We are all true crime YouTubers, though I have to make it clear that we are by no means experts and what we do say is either our own personal opinion or information gathered from different sources available online. As with every episode, you can find our sources in the description of this podcast. This episode features discussions that may be unsuitable for young ears, and so we must stress that viewer discretion is advised. You can find this podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts, whether that's on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or elsewhere. We post monthly episodes, so make sure you're following Crime Time so you don't miss out. If you want to show your appreciation for the podcast, then you can help us out by leaving a five-star review on whichever platform you use. And with all that being said, let's delve into the case of Albert Fish. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about the serial killer Albert Fish and before I get into the case I feel like I should give a little warning to our listeners. We are going to be discussing cannibalism and um, the sexual assault and murders of young children so very heavy stuff. Viewer discretion is advised. So American serial killer Albert Fish was born on the 19th of May 1870 and Albert Fish wasn't actually his birth name. His real name was Hamilton Howard Fish. His parents were Randall and Ellen Fish and they were from Washington DC and Randall was a lot older than Ellen. There was a 43 year age gap between them and when Albert was born, Randall was 75 years old. Albert had four siblings and the reason behind him changing his name to Albert was because he wanted to be named after another sibling um, of his who sadly passed away and also because he was teased a lot by other children um, because he spent a lot of his childhood in an orphanage which we'll talk more about in a second but during his time in the orphanage the other children would make fun of his name Hamilton and they would call him Ham and Eggs um, so he wanted to escape this nickname and be known as Albert Fish instead. So the Fish family had a lengthy history of mental illness. Albert's sister had mental health issues. Um, his uncle suffered from mania. His brother was held in a psychiatric hospital and his mother Ellen used to suffer really badly with hallucinations like I think it was visual hallucinations. Um, and when Albert was five, his elderly father, Randall, died from a heart attack, making Ellen a widow. And it was at this point that she decided to put her children into St. John's Orphanage in Washington because she just couldn't cope, like financially or mentally, bringing up her children on her own. So they were put into this orphanage and Albert's experience was horrific to say the least he was repeatedly abused and beaten several times by the caretakers and the caretakers wouldn't just beat the children themselves they would also make the children beat up each other so a really horrible environment for children to grow up in people believe that albert's experiences in this orphanage was probably the main thing that shaped him into the monster that he became later in life but something changed in albert after a couple of the beatings in this orphanage at first he hated them and he would dread them obviously 
But eventually he started to enjoy them and he would look forward to them. In fact, the pain from these beatings actually brought him some sort of sexual pleasure. It turned him on, which we'll talk more about a little bit later. In 1880, when Albert was 10, Ellen, his mother, got a government job. So she was on a good wage and this meant that she was able to take her children out of the orphanage and take care of them herself. However, by this time, it was too late for Albert really. His time in the orphanage had changed him and he was a completely different person. When he left, it changed his mentality. About two years later, when he was 12 years old, he became friends with a young telegraph boy and he, this telegraph boy was a bad influence on young Albert. He persuaded him to do things like eat his own feces and drink his urine. Um, and he would take Albert to, to public bathhouses where the two would just spy on other young boys and watch them undress and bathe themselves. Um, and this was when Albert was 12 years old. So in 1890, Albert was 20 years old and he started working as a male prostitute to earn his money. And at the same time, he was also sexually assaulting young children, mostly young boys. Um, he was a paedophile and he would lure children away from their houses and molest them and torture them and rape them and he did this for many years until 1898 because by this point he was actually married to a woman named Anna Mary Hoffman and he had six children with her and when Albert had his own children he decided that he wanted to change he wanted to live a normal respectable life he knew that what he was doing to other young children was really wrong and he tried to stop but as you can probably guess this didn't last long and he started sexually assaulting young boys again he also developed a fascination with penis bisection or penile bisection i think it's pronounced um, and sexual mutilation and in the year 1910 albert was in wilmington in delaware and he began a relationship with a 19 year old boy named thomas kedden by this point by the way albert was double thomas's age so he was around like 40 and thomas was 19 and thomas was therefore quite impressionable and I suppose gullible and so most people believe that Albert took advantage of him and forced him into a relationship and then one day Albert took Thomas to an old farmhouse and for the next two weeks he kept him there and he tortured him. Thomas was tied up and at the end of these two weeks, Albert Fish cut off half of his penis. And when Albert later recalled this assault, he said, quote, I will never forget his scream or the look he gave me. And Albert's plan was to murder Thomas. He wasn't originally going to let him go. He was going to murder him um, and he wanted to take his dead body back home with him. But he didn't kill him in the end because he, at the time the weather was really hot. Um, it was like a month in the summer and he thought that the meat would spoil. So instead he just left Thomas there in the farmhouse after he poured peroxide over his wounds and gave him $10. Um, ten dollars. Okay. <laughs> ten dollars for half of his penis. I know. <laughs> I'm literally Jeez. shaking my head right now. I can't believe what I'm hearing right now. This entire case already it is, is so gross. Beyond isn't it? disgusting, from the paedophilia to the penile bisection. Yeah. Oh. It gets worse. <laughs> oh no. Um, Great. But anyway, the two men, Thomas and Albert, never actually saw each other again. Albert said that he never knew what happened to Thomas after that. And I couldn't find any sources online um, that stated what happened to Thomas after that. So I don't know if he did die, you know. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he did, but I don't know. Anyway, in 1917, Anna, Albert's wife, decided to leave him for another man and she didn't tell him about this. She just left one day without her children and from then on, Albert was a single parent. Um, and once his wife had left him, he began having hallucinations, which is something that his mother, Ellen, had as well. He also began self-harming a lot and he became obsessed with sexual self-mutilation. So he would enjoy 
mutilating himself um it was like a form of sexual pleasure for him and he used to stick needles this is really gross i don't know if you guys have heard this bit but he used to stick needles into his own groin and abdomen and he would also hit himself in the groin with a ping pong paddle that he made and this paddle had like needles and nails sticking out of it oh, so it was like, oh yeah was, it, was there not like a really um famous picture like they did like an x-ray yeah. yeah that showed all the needles yeah i was just gonna ask you guys if you've seen the x-ray of his pelvis um yeah. it, it was done like years later after he was caught and they found i think it was like 29 needles um oh. embedded in that area so oh my god yeah have all of you guys seen it I haven't actually. I haven't seen it. How the hell he just went about his normal life with 29 needles in that area? I have no uh, idea. I mean, if it brought him sexual gratification, then... But I mean, that's yeah. just horrifying. How he didn't have any, like, health issues from that, though, I don't I understand. Know. I know. I wondered that as well. Yeah. I don't know if they ever took them out, but... Yeah. Like, I'm surprised he didn't he didn't get, like, any infections or anything from the needles themselves. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, you would think he would have some serious stuff. Or maybe he did, him. but we just don't know about yeah. it. But. He would also, actually, cover cotton wool with lighter fluid, and he would put this into his anus and set it alight. Um, what? So, that's hell? another gross thing. Um, and he would also get his own children and their friends to hit him with the nail-studded paddle as well, although it is, like, believed that he didn't abuse his own children. He wasn't abusive in any way towards his own children. He would just get his children to abuse him. Um, I mean, I would still argue that that's a form of yeah, mental abuse. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Still, mm -hmm. But, like, it, like, I mean in, like... There was no physical yeah, or yeah. sexual abuse. Yeah, yeah, he wouldn't physically or sexually abuse his own children, but I suppose, like you said, you could argue that was still sexual... Well, yeah, sexual abuse, I suppose, if he's getting his children to do that. Because that is gross. So soon he developed an interest in cannibalism as well, and he would eat animal meat just completely raw um to try and stop himself from wanting to eat human meat instead so he did kind of try to combat this um interest he had in cannibalism and he would eat animal meat raw instead um he also had a pretty large collection of weapons that he would use to torture people with and this collection included a handsaw a meat cleaver and a butcher's knife Around the year 1919, Albert would use this knife to stab young men. However, he would target specific men, so he would stab either men who were disabled or men that were African American because he believed that no one would miss them if they died, which is so disgusting. A couple of years later, Albert began experiencing psychosis and he said that during these psychotic episodes, he was convinced that God was sending him a message he said that god was commanding him to torture and murder children so that's what he began trying to do so it was july the 11th 1924 and albert fish decided that that day he was going to abduct a child and he came across an eight-year-old girl named beatrice keel while she was outside her parents farm and she was just playing on her own so albert went up to her and he said that he would give her some money if she would come with him and help him find some rhubarb so beatrice said yes and she was literally about to leave the farm when thankfully her mother came out and chased Albert Fish away and he did return to the farm later I think it was like later that evening and he tried to kidnap Beatrice again but um, Beatrice's father forced him to leave so Albert tried again but this time with a young boy named Cyril Quinn some sources online say that Albert had been molesting Cyril for a while so this was a boy that he knew and so when Albert approached Cyril on the street and invited him back to his apartment for some lunch he didn't think that he was in any kind of danger and he went with Albert willingly. Um, Cyril also had a friend with him at the time another young boy whose name I can actually find but um, he also went back to Albert's, Albert's apartment with 
opposite rule. Whilst the two boys were waiting for Albert to make them some lunch, they were play fighting and wrestling on Albert's bed and they noticed that underneath his mattress he had a lot of weapons like the knife, the meat cleaver, etc. And as any child would, they freaked out and they got really scared because this man had these weapons under his bed and they fled Albert's home so once again Albert's attempt at murdering a child had failed. Then on May the 28th 1928 Albert came across an advertisement in the New York World newspaper that read quote young man 18 wishes position in the country Edward Budd 406 West 15th Street. Edward Budd's family were really struggling at the time for money and so he was trying to help out by getting some work of his own and so 58 year old Albert Fish, he was 58 at the time, decided to visit the Budd family three days later and he offered Edward a job. But of course this wasn't actually true, he didn't want Edward to work for him, he actually wanted to take him away, torture him and murder him. So he went to the Bud's home and he told them that his name was actually Frank Howard. Obviously he wasn't going to give them his real name. And he told the Bud family that he would give them $15 a week if Edward would help him. I, I not sure what he wanted help with i think it was just housework around his apartment he was acting like this weak old man that just needed a helping hand so the bud family were overjoyed with this um albert or frank howard seemed like a really nice sweet old man and they like i said desperately needed the money that he was offering to pay them um and albert told the family that he would return to collect edward about a week later and when he did he met Edward's little sister um, her name was Grace Bud and she was 10 years old and as soon as Albert met Grace he decided to change his plan at first he was going to take Edward away and kill him but he decided in that moment that he wanted Grace instead so he told Grace's parents that he had to leave to go to his niece's birthday party and he said that Grace could go with him if she wanted to and of course she was a 10 year old girl she wants to go to a birthday party um so after some convincing her parents said yes so albert left with grace and he told them that he would return with her that same day but he obviously didn't and the bud family never saw frank howard again and they never saw 10 year old grace again the family contacted the police and told them all about this man frank howard but of course this was 1928 and albert had given them a fake name so it was going to be so hard for the police to find this man but they began an investigation anyway and one man his name was charles was arrested on suspicion of grace's murder i believe it was actually his wife who turned him in for some reason but of course he wasn't grace's actual killer but he spent 108 days in jail before he was found not guilty of the crime in 1930 grace's real abductor albert fish was never a suspect to the police he was never questioned about grace bud or anything and for about six years there were no significant leads in the investigation the case just went cold and it seemed as though the bud family would never find out what happened Happened to Grace. But then in November of 1934, Grace's mother Delia received a letter claiming to have been from Grace's killer, which it was Albert Fish wrote this letter, but he never um like signed it. Obviously, he just left it anonymous. And in this letter, Albert basically wrote about how he killed grace and then ate her body and i'm not going to read the letter here because it is so long have you guys seen the letter i've got it in front of me right now actually oh, have you it's so long so um i'm not going to read it now but like i said it's just basically him torturing delia and telling her about how he killed and ate grace's body it's really graphic um 
and really disturbing. One thing that he did say, I think it was towards the end of the letter, was that he didn't rape or sexually assault Grace. Um, he said that she died a virgin, but he did later confess to his attorney when he was caught and everything that he ejaculated twice when he was strangling her to death. Anyway, when Delia received this letter, she obviously took it straight to the police and they noticed that on the envelope of this letter, the letters NYPCBA were printed on it. And this stood for New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association. And they were able to trace this company and they spoke to a janitor that worked for them. And he said that he left some of these envelopes in a a rooming house that he used to live in on East 52nd Street. So they went to this rooming house where the envelopes were left and they spoke to the landlady and she said that a man named Albert Fish had checked out of that room a couple of days earlier. She also said that Albert had told her that his son had sent him some money and that he had asked the landlady to look after the money, look after the check for him and that he would be back at some point to collect it. So the police were just like, okay, well, we'll wait here until he comes back. Eventually, he came back, he returned to the building and he was arrested for the murder of Grace Budd. He did try and put up a fight at first, I believe. I think he got out like a knife and tried to fight them off, but he was an old man and they were able to wrestle it off him and take him to the police station. And he pretty much straight away admitted to Grace's murder. He told them everything, the whole story about how originally he planned on murdering Edward Budd, but then later changed his mind and decided to kill and eat Grace instead. And by this point, I think that he was aware of the fact that he was going to go to prison for the rest of his life. And so he decided to admit to other murders that he had committed. So the first one he admitted to was the murder of a nine-year-old boy named Francis McDonnell. It was late in the evening of the 14th of July, 1924, when Francis's parents decided to report him as missing because he had been out that day playing catch with his friends in the port Richmond neighbourhood of Staten Island and he just didn't return home so obviously they were really concerned and they contacted police and it wasn't long before his body was found he was discovered hanging from a tree he had been sexually assaulted and then he was strangled to death with his own suspenders albert said that he did attempt to castrate francis but he heard people approaching the scene when he was about to do this and so he just left and when the police spoke to friends of Francis they said that they witnessed him being taken by an old man with a grey moustache. Francis's mother Anna MacDonald also said that she saw a man of a similar description earlier in the day before Francis disappeared and so this description of Albert gave him the name the Grey Man. He was actually given quite a few nicknames in the media over the years including the Boogeyman, the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, a lot, a lot of different names. Anyway, Francis's murder remained unsolved for years until Albert Fish eventually admitted to it when he was arrested and everything and another murder that he admitted to was that of four-year-old Billy Gaffney. So Billy's murder happened on the 11th of February 1927. Billy was out playing with his friend who was also called Billy and they were playing together in an apartment hallway in Brooklyn. But later that day, Billy Gaffney vanished and when his friend Billy was asked where he had gone, he replied, the boogeyman took him. A witness named Joseph Meehan came forward to the police after Billy had been reported missing and he said that he saw a little boy with an old man on the day that he disappeared. He said that this old man was telling the boy to stop crying out for his mum whilst he was dragging him around on the Brooklyn tram. So Billy's body was never actually found but once Albert was arrested, photos of him, once he was arrested, sorry, for the murder of Grace Budd, um, photos of him were obviously printed in newspapers and the witness Joseph Meehan saw 
Albert's picture and he got in contact with the police and told them that Albert Fish was the same man that he saw with Billy Gaffney. It was also determined that Albert was employed as a house painter in Brooklyn in February of 1927, the same time, around the same time that Billy was abducted. Um, And apparently on the day that Billy was abducted, he was working literally only a few miles away from where he was last seen. As we know, he also confessed to the murder and he described in detail what he did to Billy in a letter to his attorney. He loved to write letters, basically, Albert Fish. He would brag about his murders in letters. This letter is also available to read online, um, but again, I'm not going to read it. He does describe in it how he killed Billy um, and he describes how he drank Billy's blood, which is why one of his nicknames is the Brooklyn Vampire. But yeah, he basically says in this letter how he murdered him, cut him up, cooked his body parts and then ate them, which is probably why his body has never been found. So Albert's trial started on the 11th of March 1935 in White Plains in New York and it lasted for about 10 days and he decided to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Like I mentioned earlier, he claimed that he heard voices from God telling him to kill these children. Eventually he was found guilty anyway and his sentence was the death penalty. He was sentenced to die and he was executed on the electric chair on the 16th of January 1936 at Sing Sing Correctional Facility. And that is pretty much it for this case. Albert was definitely connected to the three murders that I just discussed, Grace Bird, Francis McDonnell and Billy Gaffney. However, most people believe he was responsible for a lot more and he himself said that he was responsible for a lot more he said that he had killed children in every single state um and the police over the years have tried to connect him to other murders but there's just never been any there's never been enough sufficient evidence to charge him with any other disappearances um so yeah he's only ever been officially connected to three but do you guys think he was involved in more? I definitely do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. 100%. That entire case from beginning to end, it just my stomach is doing flips. Like, it's so disgusting from every single aspect of that case. It is gross. Well, I was reading, I was reading the letters as you were talking about it, and it's just, they are horrific. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> They're so graphic, aren't they? That honestly, I just couldn't read them like... I just couldn't repeat it. They just go into so much, like, so much detail. Yeah, they're so graphic. But you feel like, but you feel like Albert did that because he wanted the families to suffer even more. Yeah, you know, and he probably yeah. personally got a thrill from it as well. But I mean, mm. it's just, it's one of the most disgusting cases I've ever heard. To be honest, it is. A, I had like, I hadn't heard of this case until because I was. I was I obviously covered it on my channel, but I'd only heard of it about a week before I covered it when someone requested it to me, and I was just like, how the hell have I never heard of this guy? He is disgusting. I think I'd he- I'd heard of the, the I've heard I'd heard of Albert Fish, but I didn't know like the sort of details about it. Um Yeah, yeah I knew I knew ve- I knew very little about it. I think I'd heard of it once before, but I didn't know like all of the details. The case just progressively gets worse and worse and worse does, and yeah. worse. Like, it starts out bad. No, oh, just when you think it, it can't get bad. any worse, yeah. Mm. It's really gross. That is the case of Albert Fish. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Crime Time Podcast. Make sure you let us know what you think about this case in the comments section of the podcast YouTube video or by sending us a message to the Crime Time social media. This podcast is a monthly true crime podcast hosted by Joshua Miles, Kirsty Skye, Molly Westbrook and Dark Curiosities. This episode of the Crime Time Podcast was researched and presented by Molly Westbrook and edited by Joshua Miles. Music is licensed from Epidemic Music. 
If you want to help us out, then be sure to leave a five star review on whatever podcast streaming service you use. And with all that being said, we'll see you in the next case.